catch up on all the live shows right here on africatechradio.com. And have you noticed that Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles? Same for Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Now, Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Now, isn't that quite interesting, Tony? It is, I must say. Very <laughs> interesting. <laughs> but there's something much more interesting happening, just in case you think that this is actually like the end of the world. This uh, innovation is like the end of everything. Have you heard of the digital economy or the new economy? Well, it promises to bring to the fore the impact of digital technology on the patterns of production and consumption. And according to experts, benefits of the digital economy include, you know, labor productivity growth, some um, enhanced competitiveness, reduction of production cost. But the ones that really, really catches my attention, which I am really, really more certain about or I am more amenable to, would be the improved living standards, a lower level of poverty, and um, finding a way to equalize the social inequality. Absolutely, absolutely, Tony. Now, the idea of decentralized finance seems to be the promise upon which improved living standards, a lower level of poverty and social inequality will be satisfied. Well, for this conversation, we are joined by the CCO and co-founder of Punk Panda, uh, T.W. Dawson, to discuss a digital economy, the new oil. I know you're wondering what's Punk Panda, but don't worry, we'll get to that. We'll know what that is all about. Welcome, Dawson. How are you doing today? Great. How are you doing? Fine. We're doing great. And how is it over there? Oh, well, it's cold. It's cold. <laughs> so in case you're wondering why, you know, Gloria is asking, how is it over there? Um, we're joined by um, T.W. Dawson. He's in the United States of America. Where exactly um, in the USA are you? I'm in Connecticut, right next to New York, about 40 minutes from New York City. Okay. And we're saying good morning. And it's our afternoon actually here right now as we uh, <laughs> are, are speaking. So good morning to you. It's really good to connect with you. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm excited about this. Hmm. Okay, I'm excited too. Yeah, yes, I am. <laughs> I am. Let's let's just dive straight into the conversation. Now, uh, the dot com companies and individuals, uh, they seem to be slowly fading away and introducing a new world order. Now, Dawson, how important is the digital economy to countries described as third world based on their economies? Wow, that's that's a, that's an amazing question, which deserves an amazing answer. Hopefully, I'll be able to give you one of those. But what I think is that um, I go back to when um, the dot com era first came, and I'm a little older. I'm 46 years old, so at that time, I was in my early 20s um, when the dot com um, boom came in, and I just go back to thinking about how I wasn't in position to really take advantage of it. Um, there was a lot of people making a lot of money. Um, the internet was very, very new. It just gained mass adoption when um, American Online for us sent out uh, discs that, that, that allow everybody to, to, to download the internet on their computers. And Microsoft was making a big push to get computers in everyone's homes. And I just remember seeing it happen unfold, but at 19, 20 years old, I didn't have the resources. I didn't have the education. I didn't have the understanding of how to capitalize on it. So I see this whole new era coming in now, right now, the same way, a whole new era. And the difference is it doesn't require that much to get in. It doesn't require anybody can take a part of it. And when a new industry comes in, it's an even playing ground for the most part in the beginning. So for countries that are considered third world, for people who don't have opportunities like we have in the U.S., people can go get a job in the U.S. They can they can do they can do a lot of things. But in some countries, they don't have, like I say, bootstraps to pull themselves up with. So these different industries, when they open up, are vital for third world countries to first get educated to be aware of what's going on and to actually be a part of this new era. Because at the end of the day, it's a playing, it's an even playing ground right now. There will be more crypto billionaires in the next 20 years 
than all the dot com billionaires put together. All right. And that, that's that's happening right now. So it's vital for us as people, as a people. Being that the, the brown and, and black and brown people in this world are usually in some of the most undesirable positions that we have an opportunity to do something on our own that we don't have to depend on other people to do it. And that's the that's the power in the digital economy. That's the that's the power in blockchain and, and, and cryptocurrency. It's not ran by organizations or governments. So there's no excuse of anybody holding you back. The only thing that can hold you back is your lack of education and your lack of understanding. So that's why conferences like the one that's coming up is so very important. So we can educate our people on what's happening, what's to come, so that we'll be in position to take advantage of it. And that's what I'm all about, trying to help our people to get the understanding, to get educated so we can all prosper. Mm. What what areas of this um, digital economy um, is like re are really important, and what areas should we be looking out for to say you know this area, this area, and this area, you know, you know, just look out for it. That's a good question as well, and 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 the reason why I believe that's such a good question is because this industry is vast. There's so many, there's, there's things that are occurring in this industry right now that I don't know about that next week, next month, next year is going to be the next big thing. So it's very difficult to keep a grasp on everything that's happening in the industry. But when you look at trends and you understand the way the markets work, it's real simple. The, in order for crypto to gain mass adoption, it has to be taken in by the majority of the people. So it has to be simplified, number one. Cryptocurrency for a lot of people is very complicated. Uh, it's just very, very difficult to know what exchange to use and know how to do this, how to do that. But there are certain problems that cryptocurrency solve right now that, that we should look at and say, okay, well, this is where cryptocurrency is growing the most right now. And I say the gaming industry, when you start looking at what, Facebook or Meta is about to do. They're investing all this money into virtual reality. Gaming industry is one of the biggest industries in the world right now. You take the, the, the final championship of the gaming industry and you put the Super Bowl, the World Series, and the World Cup, the attendance all together. It's, it, it's, it's more than all those, those things put together. More people watch that than they watch the Super Bowl, the World Cup, or the NBA championships. So we see that there's a large industry out there, which is the gaming industry that's adapting crypto and crypto provides a, a solution for some of the issues that they have in there by allowing people to play, to pay, get paid in play and allow them to own their assets within the games. And so that's really big right now because gaming systems used to be you buy the game, you play the game. Now the games are free. And there's people spending more money in the game. Mm -hmm. So what kind of money are they spending? Are they spending fiat, which is very difficult because the denominations are, are so large that you can't buy something for in a game that's fractions of a cent. And then it's, it's very difficult. So it solves that problem. So I believe that the gaming, fantasy sports, uh, NFTs, I think these are the things that we ought to look at. Because the NFT is something that anybody can create. When, the, when it, the way the technology is coming out now, it's going to be easier for people to create those. And people will be able to sell their art. Artists are going to be able to sell their work. People are going to have ownership of their property. So, again, decentralizing the music industry, decentralizing the, uh, the art industry, decentralizing entertainment. Why? Because we don't have to depend on a big conglomerate to distribute or to or, or to produce our if our our, our our art or our, um our or our work we can do it ourselves and have control and gain access to our own stuff and have the rights and ownership of our work and that's very important and when we're talking about third world countries that's important because a lot of times these countries have been the countries that have been taken advantage of by other countries and now there's an industry that's happening right now that allows us to take responsibility for ourselves and not have to depend on anything outside of ourselves. And I think that's more important than anything else. Mm. I agree with you, Dawson. I think it's very important. More than anything else, we need to take these things quite important. Now, some say that 
the future is decentralized, just like uh, DeFi. DeFi. All right. Now, what's your thoughts about this and what's the best way to benefit as individuals and as groups of people? DeFi. DeFi is interesting because I don't think no one will actually argue whether DeFi is the future. I don't think that. I think that everybody says, you know, what? at some point we will be using cryptocurrency as a form of exchange between each other different companies, business to business, peer to peer to actually pay for our goods and services. I believe that everybody understands that that's what's going to happen. But the issue is that I don't think that's right around the corner. I don't think that's going to happen tomorrow because, see, I don't think no one is having a problem saying, oh, I can't pay for my gas with Bitcoin. Why they don't accept Bitcoin at the gas station? Oh, I can't pay for my laundry detergent with uh, Ethereum. No one's doing that because we have so many other means to pay for those everyday items. We have a lot of different ways to do that. We got Apple Pay. We got Google Pay. We got Stripe. We got all kinds of things. We got Visa, MasterCard. We, you know, we, we can pay check cash. We can, we can do those things like that. So DeFi is something that I think is about 10 years away. So instead of waiting for DeFi, and then the other problem with DeFi is that the markets are so volatile, meaning that they go up and down. And you have to have the right stomach to be able to deal with that. You have to have the right education to be able to deal with that. And we still don't know. The people, Fibonacci numbers, the, the uh, resistance and all these different things, it, it's, it's a nightmare. And sometimes I even question whether or not any of that stuff really works. But the point is this right here. If you don't have a large investment that you're that you're able to lose and you don't have the stomach to watch it go up and down, you know, then I don't suggest DeFi for the novice. I just don't. I think that eventually once they start regulating things and once things start to um, slow down a little bit and then the volume, well, the volatility was kind of slow down because one day Bitcoin 60,000, the next day is 20, uh, is 40,000. Who's, who's able right now other than big fish to take a $20,000 loss in a day or two? Not many people. So that's not something that I would suggest for, for the mainstream for most people. But what I will suggest is to look at project by project and say, hey, look, what's this project about? Okay, the hype of the coin, that's one thing. But if I took cryptocurrency out of this, would this be a good business? If this had nothing to do with cryptocurrency and it was just a regular business, would this be a good business? Would this be a, 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 a project that will work in the regular market as a regular business? And then when you start looking at businesses that way, and then that's when you start to say, well, this is a good project. And then the fact that it has crypto attached to it, it really makes it simple because why? The crypto is a, a share of the company. And anytime you're buying crypto from a company, you're actually receiving a share of the company, which is ownership. And I think ownership is one of the most important things as far as building wealth. Uh, I, this is really mm -hmm. good because um, while I was... Uh while we were preparing um, for this um, conversation, um, we remember that the uh, companies before now, uh, you know, a lot of it is built around the data um, from users and making their platforms like marketplaces so everyone, mm -hmm. uh, buyers can meet sellers and sellers can meet, and all of that can be exchanged and the data can be used um, for um, onward um monetization if i would put it that way mm -hmm. yeah so now you you're you have a particular project that um, you've worked on and uh, messaging video conferencing file storage and sharing crypto wallets gaming um, and even lending and a few um, other solutions punk panda mm -hmm. Tell us a bit more yes. about, you know, these solutions. Um, are we looking forward to having maybe a super app or maybe a couple of super apps? Good question. So the project is called Punk Panda. And let me just say this. The gentlemen that put this together are some of the brightest men around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't say that because I'm a part of it. I say that because I'm privileged to be a part of it. Um, and what, what they put together, what we put together was a program for the people. Bottom line, we had the people in mind when we put this together and what our program offers. First of all, it's a punk panda. It's a communication app. Really, really simple. We allow you 
to communicate with your friends, families, and so on and so forth. Whether it be through video conferencing like we're doing now, whether it be through text message, video, chat, um, or emails, or file sharing, anything like that. You can send videos up to 15, 20 minutes through a regular text message, which is something that you can't do with WhatsApp or any of these other different features. And what we've done was we put this program together so that we can give ownership to the people. All right. So the problems that we're solving are the simple problems of communication. But the most important thing about what we're doing is that we vow that we would not use the people to get rich. What do you mean, TW? Real simple. A lot of these companies are getting rich, billions and billions of dollars, using the people that are using their networks. And there's nothing really wrong with it ethically because we agreed to it. But what happens is this right here. We got used to allowing companies to use our data, sell our information, and profit off of it, and we not gain anything but just to be able to communicate with the people that we communicate with. You know, and I don't want to call out companies, but, you know, there's a lot of companies and some of the major companies are being uh, scrutinized right now as we speak of how they're handling our data and whether or not it's secure. Every six months or so, you hear about some type of uh, 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 something got hacked and our data got out somewhere. And at the end of the day, I remember there was a time not too long ago that we would have a conversation through uh, some type of uh, medium of an app or something. And then. Two days later, two hours later, we're getting advertisements about what we talked about. That was strange to me. I was like, wow, were they watching us? The government? What's going on? But then when I realized what was going on, I said, this is not right. But because people got used to it, now it's not a big deal. Now we accept it. We shouldn't accept that. We shouldn't accept it. We shouldn't accept the richest companies in the world are getting rich based off of our data. So with Punk Panda, the number one priority first is your data, your security. We don't have it. We don't have access to it. We don't want it. We just don't want it. Why? Because that's your data. There's 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 laws, human rights laws of the, called the right to privacy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And we 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 honor that. And we as people, we shouldn't give that right up just so we can use an app. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So that's what our program is all about. And then not only that we're not using your data, we're also giving you shares of our company within cryptocurrency to actually use, share, and to participate in building the largest network, the largest community in Punk Panda. And that's what our program is about. Uh, we have an app now, which we're coming out with a, a 2.0 version in the next 30 days, which is going to be amazing. And then from there, we have a, fan a sports fantasy app that's coming out as well to be able to allow people to take part in the sports fantasy craze that's going on right now to pay to play, um, pay to earn rather, or play to earn rather. And um, so we, and we have file sharing and, and, and video features. All these things are being rolled out. Our program is massive and um, we have, we're, we have a lot of excitement around it. In beta, we just had 300,000 people download our app um, in the first six weeks. So we're pretty excited about those numbers moving forward. And once we put everything together and have our official launch in the next few days, we're looking to do great things in 2022, not just for the company, but for the community and for the people a part of it. There's people actually in your region right now that has taken part of the, uh, the beta process and they have grown large organizations, uh, 40, 50,000 people in their communities. And those communities um, are going to be worth something at some point. They're worth something now, actually. They've been compensated accordingly through their wallets in the apps. And that's exciting for a lot of people because we don't know, it's, when I say we, us in America, we don't know how something as small as $15, $20 a day could impact certain people in certain parts of the world. And this is what this company is doing. We're impacting people by allowing them to do something that they're already doing, take part in a project that's bigger than themselves and possibly, just possibly gain an advantage and create some type of wealth that can change their situation. And that's what this project is really all about. Yeah. So I'm, if I would want to uh, 
maybe someone else listening, right, would say, okay, so if we say that those before us um, actually profited from our data and um, the solution you're offering says, you know what, I am not profiting from your data. How else would you get profits? How would you make the money you intend to make? Well, we have services. People buy our services. Again, let's just look at a company like Zoom. Zoom is a company that anybody can download, right? And, 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 and video conference, right? But then once you start to use it, you like it, and you start to use it all the time, and then the next thing you know, you want to have a meeting that's past an hour long. What do you have to do? You have to upgrade. You want a meeting that holds more a certain amount of people in the room. What do you have to do? You have to upgrade. So in our video conferencing, we have the same feature. You get to come in with a certain amount of people. You get to have a certain amount of hour, and it's free. It's a free service. It's a freemium model. That's what it's called, all right, a freemium model. And then at some point, we're going to have a percentage of people in our community that realizes they need, they need this for a larger scale, and they're going to upgrade. So they'll upgrade with the, the uh, video um, conferencing. They'll upgrade with the file sharing, be able to send bigger files. Uh, they'll upgrade... In the, um, or they'll buy our NFTs or they'll buy or play our games by stickers and gifts. There's some there's some companies that just made millions of dollars just selling stickers and gifts through apps. You know what I'm saying? So we have all these same things. So how we make money is by the customer looking at the value that we provide for the market and say, I need this. You know, I'd rather use it. I, instead of paying up $10 for Zoom, I can use this feature, get paid to use it, and have a better value because it's a part, it's part of something that I'm doing. It's, I actually have ownership in it. So that's what we're providing. We're providing services, meaningful services, meaningful products that people can use, and that's how we make our money. So will this, uh, are we looking at having a super app or just a set of products and maybe a, you know, one big that houses all the products in one app? Are we looking at anything like that? That is a good question. Um, I think that it'll be it'll be a few different apps, a few different projects put together. Because right now we already have the communication app, and then we also have the fantasy sports app. So automatically, we're starting out with two apps, um, two separate entities, but yet under one project. And so we'll have as we unroll all these other products out, we'll um, we'll evaluate. Um, the efficiency of having it all under one app as we unroll it. Um, so, you know, but at the end of the day, it's all under one project. Huh. Okay. Okay. That's, uh, that's all for my side. Gloria, what do you... Uh, um, you? The conference, Did You Confess 2022, is get towards young people. We're trying to reach out to the youths. We're trying to reach out to young Nigerians and anyone that would join in from all over the world. But basically, we're targeting mm -hmm. young people, all right? So, and you're mm -hmm. all you're a speaker at the, at the at the conference. I really look forward to your session, by the way. So, what will you be mm -hmm. telling the young people at the Digital Economy Conference 2022? Wow, that's a good question. Um, first of all, I am always privileged to um to be able to share my experiences, share my, my knowledge and share what little insight I can give to actually help people enrich and inspire and better themselves. I'm always, I'm always honored to do that. And to do it in front of young people is probably more um, beneficial to me because I remember being a young man, as I mentioned earlier, being 18, 19 years old, watching the dot-com era come in, not having the resources. I was a businessman from day one, I actually, um, my testimony is that I never actually worked for another human being. I've never had a job. I've always been an entrepreneur since the age of 15. And working in different industries and being an entrepreneur, you're always trying to take advantage of what's going on right then and right there. And as a young person, I would be able to, to show you how this era right here, I give you the foresight that what this era brings and what this industry is, is something that if you, as a young person, decided to lock in and educate yourself on what's going on, you'll have the ability to make money for the next 50 years. If this, the skill sets that you learn right now in this industry right here will go with you forever. You know why? Because it is just beginning. 
I'll be I'll be gone when crypto and this blockchain technology reaches reaches its peak. I'll be gone. But for some of the young people, they will be right there, full stride, ready to take advantage of it when it's at its pinnacle. And that's something that you have to foreplan right now. You have to. You have. It's not going to happen by accident. You have to actually have to look at it and say, "This is what I'm going to do. This is a conscious decision to position myself, educate myself, to align myself, to build relationships." Right. And that's the most important thing. And as my testimony is, is that I'm in a position that I'm in today because of the relationships that I built and not just the relationships. And I'm going to tell you how I build a relationship. I build the relationships through my character. I build the relationships through my hard work. I built the relationships through my consistency. And somebody saw that consistency in a young man. Somebody saw my willingness to learn. Somebody saw, I never forget the time my pastor came by my, my, my bachelor crib. I'm probably about 22 years old and my desk was filled with books research notebooks open and he just marveled he's like wow and i remember that and i said this is what it takes because an older person that has the resources will take a young person and put them in position because of their desire their heart and there's something in them that they see that was in them when they were younger and they will want to help that but that person has to be in position that person has to educate themselves that person has to be a good person that's not with the riffraff and all that other stuff mm -hmm. they have to be solid consistent and and just you just got to you just got to do the right thing you just got to do the right thing and educate yourself because it will all happen for you and that's my testimony it happened for me for being the same guy i'm the same guy at 46 than I was at 26. And that carried through because people watch you over the years and say, you know what? I know there's a guy that I met down in Logos and I know that he can do this. He has a skill set and this guy is never going to quit. He's determined. I need him for this project. So for the young people, I say to you, be consistent, be deliberate, educate yourself and be true to your word. Have a foundation and stand on it and don't move. Be who you are. Decide who you are, what you do, period. And that's it. And then live your life like that. And I, I guarantee you the doors will open up because there's so many people out here that's not consistent, it's not educated, that can't speak for themselves, that can't articulate their words, that you you become a premium out here in the world. But you got to educate yourself and be a solid person. That's what my advice is for any young person. Mm. We cannot wait for that wow. session. No, Very explosive, I must say. <laughs> Very explosive, TW. Very explosive. Thank you for your time. We've been talking about digital economy being the new oil with T.W. Dawson. He is the COO and co-founder of Punk Panda. We'll learn more about Punk Panda at the Digital Economy Summit 2022. Thank you for your time, Dawson. Thank you. I really, really appreciate you guys and seeing and, and meeting you guys for the first time, seeing how young you was. It made me say it was worth waking up this early oh. um, on, on, on this morning because anything I can do for the youth, I really appreciate you guys. Keep doing what you do. Take that advice. Like I said, educate yourself. Keep doing what you do. Stay true to your word. Listen, and you'll be fine. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening and don't forget to catch up on all the live shows right here on Africa Tech Radio.